Microman by Forrest James Ackerman. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Philip Gould. Microman by Forrest James Ackerman. Side note. The little man dared to venture into the realm of the gods, but the gods were cruel. The early morning street car, swaying and rattling along its tracks, did as much to divert my attention from the book I was reading as the contents of the book itself. I did not like Plato. Comfortable though the seat was, I was as uncomfortable as any collegiate could be whose mind would rather dwell upon tomorrow's football game than the immediate task in hand the morning session with Professor Russell and the book on my lap. My gaze wandered from the book and drifted out the distorted window, then fell to the car sill as I thought over Plato's conclusions. Something moving on the ledge attracted my attention. It was a scurrying black ant. If I had thought about it, I might have wondered how it came there. But the next moment a more curious object on the sill caught my eye. I bent over. I couldn't make out what it was at first. A bug, perhaps. Maybe it was too small for a bug. Just a little dancing dust, no doubt. Then I discerned, and gasped, on the sill there. It was a man. A man on the streetcar's windowsill. A little man. He was so tiny I would never have seen him if it hadn't been for his white attire which made him visible against the brown grain of the shellacked wood. I watched amazed as his microscopic figure moved over perhaps half an inch. He wore a blouse and shorts, it seemed, and sandals. Something might have been hanging at his side, but it was too small for me to make out plainly. His head, I thought, was silver-colored, and I think the headgear had some sort of knobs on it. All this, of course, I didn't catch at the time because my heart was hammering away excitedly and making my fingers shake as I fumbled for a matchbox in my pocket. I pushed it open and let the matches scatter out. Then as gently as my excitement would allow, I pushed the tiny man from the ledge into the box, for I had suddenly realized the greatness of this amazing discovery. The car was barely half filled, and no attention had been directed my way. I slid quickly out of the empty seat and hurriedly alighted at the next stop. In a daze I stood where I had alighted waiting for the next number ten that would return me home, the matchbox held tightly in my hand. They'd put that box in a museum one day. I collect stamps. I've heard about getting rare ones with inverted centers or some minor deviation that made them immensely valuable. I'd imagined getting one by mistake some time that would make me rich. But this! They'd build King Kong as the eighth wonder of the world, but that was only imaginary. A film! A terrifying thought crossed my mind. I pushed open the box hastily. Maybe I had been dreaming. But there it was. The unbelievable. The little man. A car was before me just leaving, its polished surface had not reflected through the haze and the new design made so little noise that I hadn't seen it. I jumped for it, my mind in such a turmoil that the conductor had to ask three times for my fare. Ordinarily I would have been embarrassed, but a young man with his mind on millions doesn't worry about little things like that. At least, not this young man. How I acted on the streetcar, or traversed the five blocks from the end of the line, I couldn't say. If I may imagine myself, though, I must have strode along the street like a determined machine. I reached the house and let myself into the basement room. Inside I pulled the shades together and closed the door, the matchbox still in my hand. No one was at home this time of day, which pleased me particularly, for I wanted to figure out how I was going to present this wonder to the world. I flung myself down on the bed and opened the matchbox. The little man lay very still on the bottom. Little man, I cried, and turned him out on the quilt. Maybe he had suffocated in the box. Irrational thought. Small though it might be to me, the little box was as big as all outdoors to him. It was the bumping about he'd endured. I hadn't been very thoughtful of him. 
He was reviving now and raised himself on one arm. I pushed myself off the bed and stepped quickly to my table to procure something with which I could control him. Not that he could get away, but he was so tiny I thought I might lose sight of him. Pen, pencil, paper, stamps, scissors, clips, none of them were what I wanted. I had nothing definite in mind, but then remembered my stamp outfit and rushed to secure it. Evidently college work had cramped my style along the collecting line, for the tweezers and magnifier appeared with a mild coating of dust, but they were what I needed, and I blew on them and returned to the bed. The little man had made his way half an inch or so from his former prison, was crawling over what I suppose were, to him, great uneven blocks of red and green and black moss. He crossed from a red into a black patch as I watched his movements through the glass, and I could see him more plainly against the darker background. He stopped and picked at the substance of his strange surroundings, then straightened to examine a tuft of the cloth. The magnifier enlarged him to a seeming half-inch or so, and I could see better now this strange, tiny creature. It was a metal cap he wore, and it did have protruding knobs, two of them, slanting at forty-five-degree angles from his temples like horns. I wondered at their use, but it was impossible for me to imagine. Perhaps they covered some actual growth. He might have had real horns, for all I knew. Nothing would have been too strange to expect. His clothing showed up as a simple, white, one-piece garment like a shirt and gym shorts. The shorts ended at the knee, and from there down he was bare except for a covering on his feet which appeared more like gloves than shoes. Whatever he wore to protect his feet, it allowed free movement of his toes. It struck me that this little man's native habitat must have been very warm. His attire suggested this. For a moment I considered plugging in my small heater. My room certainly had no tropical or subtropical temperature at that time of the morning. And how was I to know whether he shivered when he felt chill? Maybe he blew his horns. Anyway, I figured a living eighth wonder would be more valuable than a dead one, and I didn't think he could be stuffed. But somehow I forgot it in my interest in examining this unusual personage. The little man had dropped the cloth now and was staring in my direction. Of course, my direction was very general to him. But he seemed to be conscious of me. He certainly impressed me as being awfully different. But what his reactions were, I didn't know. But someone else knew. In a world deep down in smallness, in an electron of a dead cell of a piece of wood, five scientists were grouped before a complicated instrument with a horn like the early radios. Two sat and three stood, but their attention upon the apparatus was unanimous. From small hollowed cups worn on their fingers like rings came a smoke from burning incense. These cups they held to their noses frequently, and their eyes shone as they inhaled. The scientists of infrasmallness were smoking. With the exception of a recent prolonged silence which was causing them great anxiety, sounds had been issuing from the instrument for days. There had been breaks before, but this silence had been long enduring. Now the voice was speaking again, a voice that was a telepathic communication made audible. The scientist brightened. There is so much that I cannot understand, it said. The words were hesitant, filled with awe. I seem to have been in many worlds. At the completion of my experiment I stood on a land which was brown and black and very rough of surface. With startling suddenness I was propelled across this harsh country and terrifyingly I was falling. I must have dropped seventy-five feet, but the strange buoyant atmosphere of this strange world saved me from harm. My new surroundings were gray and gloomy and the earth trembled as a giant cloud passed over the sky. I do not know what it meant, but with the suddenness characteristic of this place it became very dark, and an inexplicable violence shook me into insensibility. I am conscious, now, of some giant form before me, but it is so colossal that my eyes cannot focus it, and it changes. 
Now I seem confronted by great orange mountains with curving ledges cut into their sides. Atop them are great grayish slabs of protecting opaque rock, a covering like that above our temples of Ararat, on which the rain may never fall. I wish that you might communicate with me, good men of my world, how go the gods. But now these mountains are lifting, vanishing from my sight. A great thing which I cannot comprehend hovers before me. It has many colors, but mostly there is the orange of the mountains. It hangs in the air, and from the portion nearest me grow dark trees as round as myself and as tall. There is a great redness above that opens like the catus flower, exposing the ivory white from which puffs the tongue of death. Beyond this I cannot see well. But ever so high are two gigantic caverns from which the winds of the legends blow, and suck. As dangerous as the Cadis by Dal. Alternately they crush me to the ground, then threaten to tear me from it and hurl me away. My nose was the cavern from which issued the horrifying wind. I noticed that my breath distressed the little man as I leaned over to stare at him, so drew back. Upstairs the visor buzzed. Before answering so that I would not lose the little man, I very gingerly pinched his shirt with the tongs and lifted him to the table. My breath! I am shot into the heavens like Milo and his rocket. I traverse a frightful distance. Everything changes constantly. A million miles below is chaos. This world is mad. A giant landscape passes beneath me so weird I cannot describe it. I, I cannot understand. Only my heart trembles within me. Neither science nor the gods can help or comfort in this awful world of greatness. We stop. I hang motionless in the air. The ground beneath is utterly insane, but I see vast uncovered veins of rare metal, and crystal, precious crystal, enough to cover the mightiest temple we could build. Oh, that Morsha were so blessed! In all this terrifying world the richness of the crystal and the marvelous metal do redeem. Men, I see, I believe it is a temple. It is incredibly tall, of black foundation and red spire, but it is weathered, leaning as if to fall and very bare. The people cannot love their gods as we, or else there is the hunger. But the gods may enlighten this world too, and if lowered I will make for it. A sacred temple should be a haven. Friends, I descend. The little man's eye had caught my scissors and a glass ruler as I suspended him above my desk. They were his exposed vein of metal and the precious crystal. I was searching for something to secure him. In the last second before I lowered him his heart swelled at the side of the temple, my red and black pen slanting upward from the desk holder. A stamp lying on my desk was an inspiration. I licked it, turned it gum side up, and cautiously pressed the little man against it feet first, with the thought that ought to hold him. I dashed upstairs to answer the call, but it didn't hold him. There was quite a bit of strength in that tiny body. Miserable fate! I flounder in a horrid marsh, the upset thought waves came to the men of Morsha. The viscous mire seeks to entrap me, but I think I can escape it. Then I will make for the temple. The gods may recognize and protect me there. I missed the call. I had delayed too long, but the momentary diversion had cleared my mind and allowed new thoughts to enter. I now knew what my first step would be in presenting the little man to the world. I'd write a newspaper account myself. Exclusive. Give the scoop to Earl. Would that be a sensation for his paper? Then I'd be made. A friend of the family, this prominent publisher, had often promised he would give me a break when I was ready. Well, I was ready. Excited, dashing downstairs, I half formulated the idea, the headlines, the little man under a microscope, a world afire to see him, fame, pictures, speeches, movies, money. But here I was at my desk, and I grabbed for a piece of typing paper. They'd put that in a museum, too. The stamp and the little man lay just at the edge of the sheet, 
and he clutched at a great orange mountain covered by a vast slab of curving opaque glass like the temples of Ararat. It was my thumb, but I did not see him there. I thrust the paper into the typewriter and twirled it through. I have fallen from the mountain and hang perpendicularly, perilously on a limitless white plain. I tremble on the verge of falling, but the slime from the marsh holds me fast. I struck the first key. A metal meteor is roaring down upon me. Or is it something I have never before witnessed? It has a tail that streams off beyond sight. It comes at terrific speed. I know. The gods are angry with me for leaving Morsha land. Yes, tis only they who kill by iron. Their hands clutch the rod in mighty tower Baviat and thrust it here to stamp me out. And a shaking little figure cried, Bavia Tertia, Morsha Maya, as the god struck wrathfully at a small one daring to explore their domain. For little man Jekko had contrived to see infinity, and infinity was only for the eyes of the immortals, and those of the experience who dwelt there by the god's grace. He had intruded into the realm of the rulers, the world of the afterlife, and the gods omnipotent, a mortal in the land of all. In a world deep down in smallness, in an electron of a cell of dead wood, five scientists were grouped before the complicated instruments so reminiscent of early radios. But now they all were standing. Strained, perspiring, frightened, they trembled, aghast at the dimensions the experiment had assumed. They were paralyzed with terror and awe as they heard of the wrath of the affronted gods. And the spirit of science froze within them, and would die in Morsha land. Seek the skies only by hallowed death was what they knew, and they destroyed the machine of the man who had found Venquil land, and thought to live and fled as Jekko's last thoughts came through. For many years five frightened little men of an electron world would live in deadly fear for their lives and for their souls after death, and would pray and become great disciples, spreading the gospels of the gods. True, Jekko had described a monstrous world, but how could a mere mortal experience its true meaning? It was really ethereal and beautiful was Venquil land, and they would spend the rest of their days ensuring themselves for the day of the experience, when they would assume their comforted place in the world of the afterlife. As I struck the first letter, a strange sensation swept over me. Something compelled me to stop and look at the typing paper. I was using a black ribbon, but when the key fell away, there was a tiny spot of red. End of Microman by Forrest James Ackerman Recording by Philip Gould The Plague by Teddy Keller This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Josh Horowitz The Plague by Teddy Keller. Suppose a strictly 100% American plague showed up, one that attacked only people within the political borders of the United States. Sergeant Major Andrew McLeod ignored the jangling telephones and the excited jabber of a room full of brass and lit a cigarette. Somebody had to keep his head in this mess. Everybody was about to flip. Like the telephone, two days ago Corporal Bettijean Baker had been answering the rare call on the single line in that friendly, husky voice that gave even generals pause, by saying, Good morning, Office of the Civil Health and Germ Warfare Protection Coordinator. Now there was a switchboard out in the hall with a web of lines running to a dozen girls at a half-dozen desks wedged into the outer office. And now the harried girls answered with a hasty, Germ War Protection! All the brass hats in Washington had suddenly discovered this office deep in the recesses of the Pentagon, and none of them could quite comprehend what had happened. The situation might have been funny, or at least pathetic, if it hadn't been so desperate. 
Even so, Andy McLeod's nerves and patience had frayed thin. "'I told you, General,' he snapped to the flustered brigadier. "'Colonel Patterson was retired ten days ago. I don't know what happened. Maybe this replacement sawbones got strangled in red tape. Anyhow, the brand-new lieutenant hasn't showed up here. As far as I know, I'm in charge.' "'About this, this is incredible!' a two-star general wailed. A mysterious epidemic is sweeping the country, possibly an insidious germ attack timed to proceed an all-out invasion, and a non-com is sitting on top of the whole powder keg? Andy's big hands clenched into fists, and he had to wait a moment before he could speak safely. Doggone the freckles and the unruly mop of hair that gave him such a boyish look. "'May I remind you, General,' he said, "'that I've been entombed here for two years. My staff and I know what to do.' If you'll give us some cooperation and a priority, we'll try to figure this thing out. But good heavens, a chicken colonel moaned, this is all so irregular, a non-com. He said it like a dirty word. Irregular hell, the brigadier snorted, the message getting through. There are ways, gentlemen. I suggest we clear out of here and let the sergeant get to work. He took a step toward the door, and the other officers, protesting and complaining, moved along after him. As they drifted out, he turned and said, "'We'll clear your office for top priority.' Then, dead serious, he added, "'Son, a whole nation could panic at any moment. You've got to come through.' Andy didn't waste time standing. He merely nodded to the general, snubbed out his cigarette, and buzzed the intercom. "'Bettijean, will you bring me all the latest reports, please?' Then he peeled out his beribboned blouse and rolled up his sleeves. He allowed himself one moment to enjoy the sight of the slim, black-headed corporal who entered his office. Bettijean crossed briskly to his desk. She gave him a motherly smile as she put down a thick sheaf of papers. "'You look beat,' she said. "'Brass give you much trouble?' "'Not much. We're top priority now.' He ran fingers through the thick brown hair and massaged his scalp, trying to generate stimulation to his weary and confused brain. "'What's new?' "'I've gone through some of these,' she said. "'Tried to save you a little time. "'Thanks. Sit down.' She pulled up a chair and thumbed through the papers. "'So far, no fatalities. "'That's why there's no panic yet, I guess. "'But it's spreading like, well, like a plague.' Fear flickered deep in her dark eyes. "'Any water reports?' Andy asked. "'Wichita, okay. Indianapolis, okay. "'Tulsa, okay. Buffalo, okay. "'And a bunch more.' No indication there, except, she fished out a one-page report, some little town in Tennessee. Yesterday there was a campaign for everybody to write their congressman about some deal, and today they were to vote on a new water system. Hardly anybody showed up at the polls. They've all got it. Andy shrugged. You can drink water, but don't vote for it. Oh, that's a big help. He rummaged through the clutter on his desk and came up with a crude chart. Any trends yet? It's hitting everybody, Betty Jean said helplessly. Not many kids so far, thank heavens, but housewives, businessmen, office workers, teachers, preachers, rich, poor, from Florida to Alaska. Just when you called me in, one of the girls thought she had a trend. The isolated mountain areas of the West and South. But reports are too fragmentary. What is it? he cried suddenly, banging the desk. People deathly ill, but nobody dying. And doctors can't identify the poison until they have a fatality for an autopsy. People stricken in every part of the country, but the water systems are pure. How does it spread? In food? How? There must be hundreds of canneries and dairies and packing plants all over the country. How could they all goof at the same time, even if it was sabotage? On the wind? But who could accurately predict every wind over the entire country, even Alaska and Hawaii, without hitting Canada or Mexico? And why wouldn't everybody get it in a given area? Benedine's smooth brow furrowed as she reached across the desk to grip his icy, sweating hands. Andy, do... do you think it's... well, an enemy? I don't know, he said. I just don't know. For a long moment he sat there, trying to draw strength from her punishing his brain for the glimmer of an idea. Finally, shaking his head, he pushed back into his chair and reached for the sheath of papers. We've got to find a clue, a trend, an inkling of something. He nodded toward the outer office. Stop all incoming calls. Get those girls on lines to hospitals in every city and town in the country. 
Have them contact individual doctors in rural areas, then line up another relief crew and get someone carting in more coffee and sandwiches. And on those calls, be sure we learn the sex, age, and occupation of the victims. You and I'll start with Washington. Betty Jean snapped to her feet, grinned her encouragement, and strode from the room. Andy could hear her crisp introductions to the girls on the phones. Sucking air through his teeth, he reached for his phone and directory. He dialed until every finger of his right hand was sore. He spoke to worried doctors and frantic hospital administrators and hysterical nurses. His firm, fine penmanship deteriorated to a barely legible scrawl as writer's cramp knotted his hand and arm. His voice burned down to a rasping whisper, but columns climbed up his rough chart, and broken lines pointed vaguely to trends. It was hours later when Betty Jean came back into the office with another stack of papers. Andy hung up his phone and reached for a cigarette. At that moment the door banged open, nerves raw, Betty Jean cried out. Andy's cigarette tumbled from his trembling fingers. Sergeant! the chicken colonel barked, parading into the office. Andy swore under his breath and eyed the two young officers who trailed after the colonel. Emotionally exhausted, he had to clamp his jaw against a huge laugh that struggled up in his throat. For just an instant there, the colonel had reminded him of a movie version of General Rommel strutting up and down before his tanks. But it wasn't a swagger stick the colonel had tucked under his arm. It was a folded newspaper. Opening it, the colonel flung it down on Andy's desk. "'Red Plague Sweeps Nation!' the scare headline screamed. Andy's first glance caught such phrases as alleged Russian plot and germ warfare and authorities hopelessly baffled. Snatching the paper, Andy balled it and hurled it from him. That'll help a lot, he growled hoarsely. Well then, sergeant. The colonel tried to relax his square face, but tension rode every weathered wrinkle and fear glinted behind the pale gray eyes. So you finally recognize the gravity of the situation. Andy's head snapped up, heated words searing toward his lips. Betty Jean stepped quickly around the desk and laid a steady hand on his shoulder. Colonel, she said levelly, you should know better than that. A shocked young captain exploded. Corporal, maybe you'd better report to— All right, Andy said sharply. For a long moment he stared at his clenched fists. Then he exhaled slowly and, to the colonel, flatly and without apology, he said— You'll have to excuse the people in this office if they overlook some of the G.I. niceties. We've been without sleep for two days, we're surviving on sandwiches and coffee, and we're fighting a war here that makes every other one look like a Sunday school picnic. He felt Betty Jean's hand tighten reassuringly on his shoulder, and he gave her a tired smile. Then he hunched forward and picked up a report. So say what you came here to say and let us get back to work. Sergeant! the captain said, as if reading from a manual. Insubordination cannot be tolerated, even under emergency conditions. Your conduct here will be noted and— Oh, good heavens, Betty Jean cried, her fingers biting into Andy's shoulder. Do you have to come in here trying to throw your weight around when this man— That's enough, the colonel snapped. I had hoped that you two would cooperate, but— he let the sentence trail off as he swelled up a bit with his own importance. I have turned Washington upside down to get these two officers from the Surgeon General's office. Sergeant, Corporal, you are relieved of your duties as of this moment. You will report to my office at once for suitable disciplinary action. Betty Jean sucked in a strained breath and her hand flew to her mouth. But you can't. Let's go, Andy said, pushing up from his chair. Ignoring the brass, he turned to her and brushed his lips across hers. Let them sweat a while. Let them have the whole stinking business. Whatever they do to us, at least we can get some sleep. But you can't quit now, Betty Jean protested. These brass hats don't know from— Corporal, the colonel roared. And from the door, an icy voice said, Yes, colonel. The colonel and his captains wheeled, stared, and saluted. Oh, general, the colonel said. I was just— I know, the brigadier said, stepping into the room. I've been listening to you, and I thought I suggested that everybody leave the sergeant and his staff alone. But, General, I— The general showed the colonel his back and motioned Andy into his chair. He glanced to Betty Jean, and a smile warmed his wedge face. Corporal, were you speaking just then as a woman or as a soldier? Crimson erupted into Betty Jean's face, and her tight laugh said many things. She shrugged. Both, I guess. The general waved her to a chair, and, oblivious of the colonel, pulled up a chair for himself. 
the last trace of humor drained from his face as he leaned elbows on the desk. Andy, this is even worse than we had feared. Andy fumbled for a cigarette, and Bettijean passed him a match. The captain opened his mouth to speak, but the colonel shushed him. I've just come from intelligence, the general said. We haven't had a report, nothing from our agents, from the diplomatic corps, from the civilian newspapermen, not a word from any Iron Curtain country for a day and a half. Everybody's frantic. The last item we had, it was a coded message the Reds had tried to censor, was an indication of something big in the works. A day and a half ago, Andy mused, just about the time we knew we had an epidemic, and about the time they knew it. It could just be propaganda, Bettijean said hopefully, proving that they could cripple us from within. The general nodded. Or it could be the softening up for an all-out effort. Every American base in the world is alerted, and every serviceman is being issued live ammunition. If we're wrong, we've still got an epidemic and panic that could touch it off. If we're right, well, we've got to know. What can you do? Andy dropped his haggard face into his hands. His voice came through muffled. I can sit here and cry. For an eternity he sat there, futility piling on helplessness, aware of Bettijean's hand on his arm. He heard the colonel try to speak and sensed the general's movement that silenced him. Suddenly he sat upright and slapped a palm down on the desk. We'll find your answers, sir. All we ask is cooperation. The general gave both Andy and Bettijean a long, sober look, then launched himself from the chair. Pivoting, he said, Colonel, you and your captains will be stationed by that switchboard out there. For the duration of this emergency, you will take orders only from the sergeant and the corporal here. But, General, the colonel wailed, a non-com? I'm assigned. The general snorted. Insubordination cannot be tolerated unless you find a two-star general to outrank me. Now, as I said before, let's get out of here and let these people work. The brass exited wordlessly. Bettijean sighed noisily. Andy found his cigarette dead and lit another. He fancied a tiny lever in his brain, and he shifted gears to direct his thinking back into the proper channel. Abruptly, his fatigue began to lift. He picked up the new pile of reports Bettijean had brought in. She moved around the desk and sat, noting the phone book he had used, studying the names he had crossed off. "'Did you learn anything?' she asked. Andy coughed, trying to clear his raw throat. It's crazy, he said. From the Senate and House on down, I haven't found a single government worker sick. I found a few, she said, over in a Virginia hospital. But I did find, Andy said, flipping through pages of his own scrawl, a society matron and her social secretary, a whole flock of office workers, business, not government, and new parents and newly engaged girls, and... He shrugged. Did you notice anything significant about those office workers? Andy nodded. I was going to ask you the same, since I was just guessing. I hadn't had time to check it out. Well, I checked some. Practically none of my victims came from big offices, either business or industry. They were all out of one- and two-girl offices or small businesses. That was my guess. And do you know that I didn't find a doctor, dentist, or attorney? Nor a single postal worker. Andy tried to smile. One thing we do know, it's not a communicable thing. Thank heaven for... He broke off as a cute blonde entered and put stacks of reports before both Andy and Bettijean. The girl hesitated, fidgeting, fingers to her teeth. Then, without speaking, she hurried out. Andy stared at the top sheet and groaned. Oh, this may be something. Half the adult population of Aspen, Colorado is down. What? Bettijean frowned over the report in her hand. It's the same thing, only not quite as severe, in Taos and Santa Fe, New Mexico. Writers? Mostly. Some artists, too, and musicians, and poets are among the hard hit. This is insane, Andy muttered. Doctors and dentists are fine. Writers and poets are sick. Make sense out of that. Bettijean held up a paper and managed a confused smile. Here's a country doctor in Tennessee. He doesn't even know what it's all about. Nobody's sick in his valley. Somebody in our outer office is organized, Andy said, pulling at a cigarette. Here are reports from a dozen military installations all lumped together. What does it show? Blackout. By order of somebody higher up. No medical releases. Must mean they've got it. He scratched the growing stubble on his chin. If this were a fifth column set up, wouldn't the armed forces be the first hit? Sure. 
Benajin brightened, then sobered. Maybe not. The brass could keep it secret if an epidemic hit an army camp, and they could slap a control condition on any military area, but the panic will come from the general public. Here's another batch, Andy said. Small college towns under 25,000 population. All hard hit. Well, it's not split intellectually. Small colleges and small offices and writers get it. Doctors don't and dentists don't. But we can't tell who's got it on the military bases. And it's not geographical. Look, remember those two reports from Tennessee? That place where they voted on water bonds or something? Everybody had it. But the country doctor in another section hadn't even heard of it. Andy could only shake his head. Betty Jean heaved herself up from the chair and trudged back to the outer office. She returned momentarily with a tray of food. Putting a paper cup of coffee and a sandwich in front of Andy, she sat down and nibbled at her snack like an exhausted chipmunk. Andy banged a fist at the desk again. Coffee splashed over the rim of his cup onto the clutter of papers. "'It's here,' he said angrily. "'It's here somewhere, but we can't find it.' "'The answer?' "'Of course. What is it that girls in small offices do or eat or drink or wear that girls in large offices don't do or eat or drink or wear? What do writers and doctors do differently?' or poets and dentists. What are we missing? What? In the outer office, a girl cried out. A body thumped against a desk, then a chair, then to the floor. Two girls screamed. Andy bolted up from his chair. Racing to the door, he shouted back to Bettijean, Get a staff doctor and a chemist from the lab. It was the girl who had been so nervous in his office earlier. Now she lay in a pathetic little heap between her desk and chair, whimpering, shivering, eyes wide with horror. The other girls clustered at the hall door, plainly ready to stampede. "'It's not contagious,' Andy growled. "'Find some blankets or coats to cover her, and get a glass of water.' The other girls, glad for the excuse, dashed away. Andy scooped up the fallen girl and put her down gently on the close-jammed desks. He used a chair cushion for a pillow. By then the other girls were back, with a blanket and a glass of water. He covered the girl, gave her a sip of water, and heard somebody murmur, "'Poor Janice!' "'Now,' Andy said brightly, "'how's that, Janice?' She mustered a smile and breathed, "'Better. I—I I was so scared. Fever and dizzy. Symptoms like the epidemic.' "'Now you know there's nothing to be afraid of.' Andy said, feeling suddenly and ridiculously like a pill-roller with a practiced bedside manner. You know, you may feel pretty miserable, but nobody's conked out with this stuff yet. Janice breathed out and her taut body relaxed. Don't hurry, Andy said, but I want you to tell me everything that you did, everything you ate or drank in the last, oh, twelve hours. He felt a pressure behind him and swiveled his head to see Betty Jean standing there. He tried to smile. What time is it? Janice asked weakly. Andy glanced to a wall clock, then gave it a double take. One of the girls said, "'It's three o'clock in the morning.' She edged nearer Andy, obviously eager to replace Janice as the center of attention. Andy ignored her. "'I... I've been here since... golly, yesterday morning at nine. Janice said. "'I came to work as usual, and... Slowly, haltingly, she recited the routine of a routine workday then told about the quick snack that sufficed for supper and about staying on her phone and typewriter for another five hours. It was about eleven when the relief crew came in. "'What did you do then?' Andy asked. "'I... I took a break and...' Her ivory skin reddened, the color spreading into the roots of her fluffy curls, and she turned her face away from Andy. "'And I had a sandwich and some coffee and got a little nap in the ladies' lounge and... and that's all.' "'And that's not all.' Andy prompted, "'What else?' "'Nothing,' Janice said too quickly. Andy shook his head. "'Tell it all, and maybe it'll help.' "'But, but—' "'Was it something against regulations?' "'I—I I don't know. I think—' "'I'll vouch for your job in this office.' "'Well—' She seemed on the verge of tears, and her pleading glance sought out Andy, then Betty Jean, then her co-workers. Finally resigned, she said, "'I—I I wrote a letter to my mother.' Andy swallowed against his groan of disappointment. "'And you told her about what we were doing here?' Janice nodded, and tears welled into her wide eyes. "'Did you mail it?' Y yes "'You didn't use a government envelope to save a stamp?' "'Oh, no. I always carry a few stamps with me.' She choked down a sob. "'Did I do wrong?' "'No, I don't think so,' Andy said, patting her shoulder. 
There's certainly nothing secret about this epidemic. Now you just take it easy and... Oh, here's a doctor now. The doctor, a white-headed Air Force major, bustled into the room. A lab technician in a white smock was close behind, and he could only shrug and indicate the girl. Turning away, lighting a cigarette, he tried to focus on the tangle of thoughts that spun through his head. Doctors, writers, society matrons, office workers, Aspen, Taos, and government towns, thousands of people sick, but none in that valley in Tennessee, and few government workers, just one girl in his office, and she was sicker and more frightened about a letter, and... Hey, wait! Andy yelled. Everyone in the room froze as Andy spun around, dashed to Betty Jean's desk, and yanked out the wide top drawer. He pawed through it, straightened, then leaped across to the desk Janice had used. He snatched open drawer after drawer. In a bottom one, he found her purse. Ripping it open, he dumped the contents on the desk and clawed through the pile until he found what he wanted. Handing it to the lab technician, he said, Get me a report, fast! The technician darted out. Andy wheeled to Bettijean. Get the brass in here, and call the general first. To the doctor, he said, Give that girl the best of everything. Then he ducked back to his own office and to the pile of reports. He was still poring over them when the general arrived. Half a dozen other brass hats, none of whom had been to bed, were close behind. The lab technician arrived a minute later. He shook his head as he handed his hastily scribbled report to Andy. It was Bettijean who squeezed into the office and broke the brittle silence. Andy, for heaven's sake, what is it? Then she moved around the desk to stand behind him as he faced the officers. Have you got something? the brigadier asked. Some girl outside was babbling about writers and doctors and dentists and college students and little secretaries and big secretaries. Have you established a trend? Andy glanced at the lab report, and his smile was as relieved as it was weary. Our problem, he said, was in figuring out what a writer does that a doctor doesn't, why girls from small offices were sick, and why senators and postal workers weren't, why college students caught the bug and people in a Tennessee community didn't. The lab report isn't complete. They haven't had time to isolate the poison and prescribe medication. But, he held up a four-cent stamp, here's the villain, gentlemen. The big brass stood stunned and shocked. Mouths flapped open and eyes bugged at Andy, at the stamp. Bettijean said, Sure, college kids and engaged girls and new parents and especially writers and artists and poets, they'd all lick lots of stamps. Professional men have secretaries, big offices have postage meter machines, and government offices have free franking, and... She threw her arms around the sergeant's neck. Andy, you're wonderful! The old American ingenuity, the colonel said, reaching for Andy's phone. I knew we could lick it. Now all we have to do is... At ease, colonel, the brigadier said sharply. He waited until the colonel had retreated, then addressed Andy. It's your show. What do you suggest? Get somebody, maybe even the president, on all radio and TV networks. Explain frankly about the four centers and warn against licking any stamps. Then he broke off as his phone rang. Answering, he listened for a moment, then hung up and said, But before the big announcement, get somebody checking on the security clearances at whatever plant it is where they print stamps. This is a big deal. Somebody may have been planted years ago for this operation. It shouldn't be too hard. But there's no evidence it was a plot yet. Could be pure accident. Some chemical in the stickum spoiled. Do they keep the stickum in barrels? Find out who had access. And, oh, the phone call. That was a lab. The antidote's simple and the cure should be quick. They can phone or broadcast the medical information to doctors. The man on the phone said they could start emptying hospitals in six hours. And maybe we should release some propaganda. United States whips mystery virus, or something like that. And we could send the Kremlin a stamp collection, and... Ah, you take it, sir. I'm pooped. The general wheeled to fire a salvo of commands. Officers poured into the corridor. Only the brigadier remained, a puzzled frown crinkling his granite brow. But you said the postal workers weren't getting sick. Andy chuckled. That's right. Did you ever see a post office clerk lick a stamp? They always use a sponge. The general looked to Bettijean, to Andy, to the stamp. He grinned, and the grin became a rumbling laugh. <laughs> How would you two like a thirty-day furlough to rest up, or to get better acquainted? Bettijean squealed. Andy reached for her hand. And while you're gone, the general continued, 
I'll see what strings I can pull. If I can't wrangle you a couple of battlefield commissions, I'll zip you both through OCS so fast you won't even have time to pin on the bars. But neither Andy nor Bettijean had heard a word after the mention of furlough. Like a pair of puppy lovers, they were sinking into the depths of each other's eyes. And the general was still chuckling as he picked up the lone four-cent stamp in his left hand, made a gun of his right hand, and marched the stamp out of the office under guard. End of The Plague by Teddy Keller. Recording by Josh Horowitz, Los Angeles. A Prize for Eddie by J. F. Bone. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Dale Grothman. The committee had, unquestionably, made a mistake. There was no doubt that Eddie had achieved a long-sought cancer cure, but awarding the Nobel Prize was, nonetheless, a mistake. A Prize for Eddie by J. F. Bone The letter from America arrived too late. The committee had regarded acceptance as a foregone conclusion, for no one since Boris Pasternak had turned down a Nobel Prize. So when Professor Dr. Nels Christensen opened the letter, there was not the slightest fear on his part, or on that of his fellow committeemen, Dr. Eric Karlstrom and Dr. Sven Eklund, that the letter would be anything other than the usual routine acceptance. At last we learn the identity of this great research worker, Christensen muttered as he scanned the closely typed sheets. Karlstrom and Eklund waited impatiently, wondering at the peculiar expression that had fixed itself on Christensen's face. Fine beads of sweat appeared on the professor's high, narrow forehead as he laid the letter down. Well, he said heavily, now we know. No what? Eklund demanded. What does it say? Does she accept? She accepts, Carlson said in a peculiar half-strangled tone as he passed the letter to Eklund. See for yourself. Eklund's reaction was different. His face was a mottled reddish-white as he finished the letter, and handed it across the table to Karlstrom. Why, he demanded of no one in particular, did this have to happen to us? It was bound to happen some time, Karlstrom said. It's just our misfortune it happened to us. He chuckled as he passed the letter back to Christensen. At least this year the presentation should be an event worth remembering. It seems that we have a little problem, Christensen said, making what would probably be the understatement of the century. Possibly there would be greater understatements in the remaining ninety-nine years of the twenty-first century, but Karlstrom doubted it. We certainly have our necks out, he agreed. We can't do it, Eklund exploded. We simply can't award the Nobel Prize in Medicine and Physiology to that, that C. Eddy. He sputtered into silence. We can hardly do anything else, Christensen said. There's no question as to the identity of the winner. Dr. Hansen's letter makes that unmistakably clear. There's no question that the award is deserved. We still could award it to someone else, Eklund said. Not a chance. We've already said too much to the press. It's known all over the world that the medical award is going to the discoverer of the basic cause of cancer, to the founder of modern neoplastic therapy, Christensen grimaced. If we change our decision now, there'd be all sorts of embarrassing questions from the press. I can see it now, Carlstrom said. The banquet, the table, the flowers and Professor Dr. Niels Christensen, in formal dress, with the order of St. Olaf gleaming across his white shirt-front, standing before that distinguished audience, and announcing, The Nobel Prize in Medicine and Physiology is awarded to... And then a deadly hush, when the audience sees the winner. You needn't rub it in, Christensen said unhappily. I can see it, too. These Americans, Eklund said bitterly, 
he wiped his damp forehead. The picture Carlstrom had drawn was accurate, but hardly appealing. One simply can't trust them. Publishing a report as important as that as a laboratory release. They should have given proper credit. They did, Carlstrom said. They did, precisely. But the world, including us, was too stupid to see it. We have only ourselves to blame. If it weren't for the fact that the work was inspired and effective, Christensen muttered, we might have a chance of salvaging the situation. But through its application, 95% of cancers are now curable. It is obviously the outstanding contribution to medicine in the past five decades. But we must consider the source, Eklund protested. This award will make the prize for medicine a laughingstock. No doctor will ever accept another. If we go through with this, we might as well forget about the medical award from now on. This will be its swan song. It hits too close to home. Too many people have been saying things about our profession and its trend toward specialization, and to have the Nobel Prize confirm them would alienate every doctor in the world. We simply can't do it. Yet, who else has made a comparable discovery? Or one that is even half as important? Christensen asked. That's a good question, Carlstrom said, and a good answer to it isn't going to be easy to find. For my part, I can only wish Alfex Laboratories had displayed an interest in literature rather than medicine. Then our colleagues at the Academy would have had the painful decision. Their task would be easier than ours, Christensen said wearily. After all, the criteria for art is more flexible. Medicine, unfortunately, is based upon facts. That's the hell of it, Carlstrom said. There must be some way to solve this problem, Eklund said. After all, it was a perfectly natural mistake. We never suspected that Alphex was a physical rather than biological sciences laboratory. Besides, that might offer grounds. I don't think so, Carlstrom interrupted. The means in this case aren't important as the results, and we can't deny that the cancer problem is virtually solved. Even though men have been saying for the past two generations that the answer was probably in the literature, and all that was needed was someone with the intellect and the time to put the facts together, the fact remains that it was C. Eddy who did the job. And it required a bit more than merely collecting facts. Intelligence and original thinking of high order was involved. Christensen sighed. Anyone, Eklund said bitterly. Something, you mean? C. Eddy. C. E. D. Computer. Extrapolating. Discriminatory. Manufactured by Alphex Laboratories, Trenton, New Jersey, USA. C. Eddy. Americans. Always naming things. A machine wins the Nobel Prize. It's fantastic. Christensen shook his head. It's not fantastic, unfortunately, and I see no way out. We can't even award the prize to the team of engineers who designed and built Eddie. Dr. Hansen is right when he says the discovery was Eddie's, and not the engineers. It would be like giving the prize to Albert Einstein's parents because they created him. Is there any way we can keep the presentation secret? Eklund asked. I'm afraid not. The presentations are public. We've done too good a job publicizing the Nobel Prize. As a telecast item, it's almost the equal of the Motion Picture Academy Awards. I can imagine the reaction when our candidate is revealed in all her metallic glory. A two-meter cube of steel filled with micro-miniaturized circuits, complete with flashing lights and cog wheels. Carlson chuckled. And where are you going to hang the medal? Christensen shivered. I wish you wouldn't give that medal nightmare a personality, he said. It unnerves me. Personally, I wish that Dr. Hansen, Alphex Laboratories, and Eddy were all at the bottom of the ocean, in some nice deep spot like the Marianas Trench. He shrugged. 
Of course, we won't have that sort of luck, so we'll have to make the best of it. It just goes to show you can't trust Americans, Eklund said. I've always thought we should keep our awards on this side of the Atlantic, where people are sane and civilized. Making a personality out of a computer. Ugh. I suppose that's their idea of a joke. I doubt it, Christensen said. They just like to name things, preferably with female names. It's a form of insecurity, the mother fixation. But that's not important. I'm afraid, gentlemen, that we shall have to make the award as we have planned. I can see no way out. After all, there's no reason why the machine cannot receive the prize. The conditions merely state that it is to be presented to the one, regardless of nationality, who makes the greatest contribution to medicine or physiology. I wonder how His Majesty will take it, Carlson said. The King! I'd forgotten that, Eklund gasped. I expect he'll have to take it, Christensen said. He might even appreciate the humor in the situation. Gustav Adolf is a good king, but there are limits, Eklund observed. There are other considerations, Christensen replied. After all, Eddie is the reason the crown prince is still alive, and Gustav is fond of his son. After all these years? Christensen smiled. Swedish royalty was long-lived. It was something of a standing joke that King Gustav would probably outlast the pyramids, providing the pyramids lived in Sweden. I am sure His Majesty will cooperate. He has a strong sense of duty, and since the real problem is his, not ours, I doubt if he will shirk it. How do you figure that? Eklund asked. We merely select the candidate according to the rules and according to the nature of their contribution. Eddie is obviously the outstanding candidate in medicine for this year. It deserves the prize. We could be compromising with principle if we do not award it fairly. I suppose you're right, Eklund said gloomily. I can't think of any reasonable excuse to deny the award. Nor I, Carlson said. But what did you mean by the remark about this being the king's problem? You forget, Christensen said mildly, of all of us, the king has the most difficult part. As you know, the Nobel Prize is formally presented at a state banquet. Well, His Majesty is the host, Christensen said. And just how does one eat dinner with an electronic computer? The End of A Prize for Eddie by J. F. Moan Proof of the Pudding by Robert Checkley This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Dale Grothman One Man's Fact is Fantasy for Another except the man whose fantasies become solid fact. Proof of the Pudding by Robert Checklin His arms were very tired, but he lifted the chisel and mallet again. He was almost through. Only a few more letters, and the inscription, cut deeply into the tough granite, would be finished. He rounded out the last period, and straightened up, dropping his tools carelessly to the floor of the cave. Proudly, he wiped the perspiration from his dirty, stubbled face, and read what he had written. I rose from the slime of the planet. Naked and defenseless, I fashioned tools. I built and demolished, created and destroyed. I created a thing greater than myself that destroyed me. My name is Man, and this is my last work. He smiled. What he had written was good. Not literary enough, perhaps, but a fitting tribute to the human race, written by the last man. He glanced at the tools at his feet. Having no further use for them, he dissolved them, and, hungry from his long work, squatted in the rubble of the cave and created a dinner. He stared at the food for a moment, wondering what was lacking, then, sheepishly, created a table and chair, utensils, and plates. 
He was embarrassed. He had forgotten them again. Although there was no need to rush, he ate hurriedly, noting the odd fact that when he didn't think of anything specific, he always created hamburger, mashed potatoes, peas, bread, and ice cream. Habit, he decided. Finished, he made the remnants of the meal disappear, and with them the plates, utensils, and table. The chair he retained. Sitting on it, he stared thoughtfully at the inscription. It's fine, he thought, but no human being other than myself will ever read it. It was fairly certain that he was the last man alive on earth. The war had been thorough. Thorough as only man, a meticulous animal, could make it. There were no neutrals in this war. No middle-of-the-road policy. You were on one side or the other. Bacteria, gas, and radiations had covered the earth like a vast cloud. In the first days of that war, invincible secret weapon had succeeded secret weapon with almost monotonous regularity. And after the last hand had pushed the last button, the bombs, automatically guided and impelled, had continued to rain down. The unhappy earth was a huge junkyard, without a living thing, plant or animal, from pole to pole. He had watched a good part of it. He had waited until he was fairly sure the last bomb had been dropped, and then he had come down. Very clever of you, he thought bitterly, looking out the mouth of the cave at the lava plain his ship rested on, and the twisted mountains behind it. You're a traitor, but who cares? He had been a captain in the Western Hemisphere defense. Within two days of warfare, he had known what the end would be. Filling a cruiser with canned air, food, and water, he had fled. In the confusion and destruction, he knew that he would never be missed. After a few days, there was no one left to miss him. He had raced the big ship to the dark side of the moon and waited. It was a twelve-day war. He had guessed it would last fourteen, but he had waited nearly six months before the automatic missile stopped falling. Then he came down, to find himself the only survivor. He had expected others to recognize the futility of it, load ships and flock to the dark side of the moon also. Evidently there had been no time, even if there had been the desire. He had thought that there would be some scattered groups of survivors, but he hadn't found any. The war had been too thorough. Landing on the earth should have killed him, for the air itself was poison. He hadn't cared, and he had lived. He seemed to be immune to the various kinds of germs and radiations, or perhaps that was part of his new power. He certainly had encountered enough of both, skipping around the world in his ship, from the ruins of one city to another, across blasted valleys and plains, scorched mountains. He had found no life. But he did discover something. He could create. He realized the power on his third day on Earth. Wistfully, he had wished for a tree in the midst of the melted rock and metal. A tree had appeared. The rest of the day he experimented and found that he could create anything that he had ever seen or heard about. Things he knew best, he could create best. Things he knew just from books, or conversation, palaces, for example, tended to be lopsided and uncertain, although he could make them nearly perfect by laboring mentally over the details. Everything he created was three-dimensional. Even the food tasted like food and seemed to nourish it. He could forget all about one of his creations, go to sleep, and it would still be there when he awakened. He could also uncreate. A single concentrated thought and the thing he had made would vanish. The larger the thing, the longer it would take to uncreate. Things he hadn't made, valleys and mountains, he could uncreate too, but it took longer. It seemed as though matter was easier to handle once he had shaped it. He could make birds and small animals, or things that looked like birds and small animals. He had never tried to make a human being. He wasn't a scientist, he had been a space pilot. He had a vague concept of atomic theory and practically no idea of genetics. He thought that some change must have taken place in his germ plasma, or in his brain, or perhaps in the earth. The why of it all didn't especially bother him. 
It was a fact, and he accepted it. He stared at the monument again. Something about it bothered him. Of course, he could have created it, but he didn't know if the things he made would endure after his death. They seemed stable enough, but they might dissolve with his own dissolution. Therefore, he compromised. He created a chisel and mallet, but selected a granite wall that he hadn't made. He cut the letters into the inside of the wall of the cave so that they would be safe from the elements, working many hours at a stretch, sleeping and eating beside the wall. From the mouth of the cave he could see his ship, perched on a level plain of scorched ground. He was in no hurry to get back to it. In six days the inscription was done, cut deeply and eternally into the rock. The thought that had been bothering him as he stared at the gray granite finally came to the surface. The only people who would come to read it would be visitors from the stars. How would they decipher it? He stared at the inscription angrily. He should have written it in symbols. But what kind of symbols? Mathematics, of course, but what would that tell them about man? And what made him think they would discover the cave anyway? There was no use for an inscription when man's entire history was written over the face of the planet, scorched into the crust for anyone to see. He cursed his stupidity for wasting six days working on a useless inscription. He was about to uncreate it when he turned his head, hearing footsteps at the mouth of the cave. He almost fell off the chair, getting to his feet. A girl was standing there. He blinked rapidly. She was still there. A dark-haired girl dressed in a torn, dirty, one-piece overall. Hi, she said, and walked into the cave. I heard you hammering from the valley. Automatically he offered her his chair and created another for himself. She tested it gingerly before she sat down. I saw you do it, she said, but I still don't believe it. Mirrors? No, he muttered uncertainly. I create. That is, I have the power to... Wait a minute. How did you get here? While he was demanding to know, he considered and rejected possibilities. Hidden in a cave? On a mountain top? No, there would only be one possible way. I was in your ship, pal, she leaned back on the chair and clasped her hands around one knee. When you loaded up that cruiser, I figured you were going to beat it. I was getting tired of setting fuses eighteen hours a day, so I stowed away. Anybody else alive? No. Why didn't I see you then? He stared at the ragged, beautiful girl, and a vague thought crossed his mind. He reached out and touched her arm. She didn't draw back, but her pretty face grew annoyed. I'm real, she said bluntly. You must have seen me at the base, remember? He tried to think back to a time when there had been a base, centuries ago, it seemed. There had been a dark-haired girl there, one who had never given him a tumble. I think I froze to death, she said, or into coma, anyhow, a few hours after your ship took off. Lousy heating system you have in that crate she shivered reminiscently. Would have used up too much oxygen, he explained. Just kept the pilot's compartment heated and aired. Used a suit to drag supplies forward when I needed them. I'm glad you didn't see me, she laughed. I must have looked like the devil, all covered with frost and killed, I bet. Some sleeping beauty I probably made. Well, I froze. When you opened all the compartments, I revived. That's the whole story. Guess it took a few days. How come you didn't see me? I suppose I never looked back there, he admitted. Quick enough, I found out I didn't need supplies. Funny, I thought I opened all the compartments, but I don't really remember. She looked at the inscription on the wall. What's that? I thought I'd leave some sort of monument. Who's going to read it? she said practically. No one, probably. It's just a foolish idea. He concentrated on it. In a few moments, the granite wall was bare. I still don't understand how you could be alive now, he said, puzzled. But I am. I don't see how you do that, she gestured at the chair and the wall. But I'll accept the fact that you can. Why don't you accept the fact that I'm alive? Don't get me wrong, the man said. I want company very much, especially female company. It's just... 
Turn your back. She complied with a questioning look. Quickly, he destroyed the stubble on his face and created a clean pair of pressed pants and a shirt. Stepping out of his tattered uniform, he put on the new clothes, destroying the rags and, on an afterthought, created a comb and straight distangled brown hair. All right, he said, you can turn back now. Not bad, she smiled, looking him over. Let me use that comb, and would you please make me a dress, size twelve, but see that the weight goes in the right places. On the third attempt he had the thing right. He had never realized how deceptive the shapes of women can be, and then he made a pair of gold sandals with high heels for her. A little tight, she said, putting them on, and not too practical without sidewalks. But thanks much. This trick of yours really solves the Christmas present problem, doesn't it? Her dark hair was shining in the noon sun, and she looked very lovely and warm and human. See if you can create, he urged, anxious to share his startling new ability with her. I already tried, she said. No go. Still a man's world. He frowned. How can I be absolutely sure you're real? That again? Do you remember creating me, master? She said mockingly, bending to loosen the strap on one shoe. I had been thinking about women, he said grimly. I might have created you while I was asleep. Why shouldn't my subconscious mind have as much power as my conscious mind? I would have equipped you with a memory, given you a background. You would have been extremely plausible. And if my subconscious mind did create you, then it would make certain that my conscious mind would never know. You're ridiculous. Because if my conscious mind knew, he went on relentlessly, it would reject your existence. Your entire function as a creation of my subconscious would be to keep me from knowing, to prove by any means in your power, by any logic, that you were, let's see you create a woman then, if your mind is so good. She crossed her arms and leaned back in the chair, giving a single sharp nod. All right. He stared at the cave wall, and a woman started to appear. It took shape sloppily. One arm too short, legs too long. Concentrating harder, he was able to make its proportions fairly true. But its eyes were set at odd angles. Its shoulders and back were sloped and twisted. He had created a shell without brains or internal organs. An automaton. He commanded it to speak, but only gulps came out of its shapeless mouth. He hadn't given it any vocal apparatus. Shuddering, he destroyed the nightmare figure. I'm not a sculptor, he said, nor am I God. I'm glad you finally realized that. That still doesn't prove, he continued stubbornly, that you're real. I don't know what my subconscious mind is capable of. Make something for me, she said abruptly. I'm tired of listening to this nonsense. I've hurt her feelings, he thought. The only other human on earth, and I've hurt her. He nodded, took her by the hand, and led her out of the cave. On a flat plain below he created a city. He had experimented with it a few days back, and it was much easier this time. Patterned after pictures and childhood dreams of the Thousand and One Nights, it towered black and white and rose. The walls gleamed ruby, and the gates were silver-stained ebony. The towers were red gold and sapphires glittered in them. A great staircase of milky ivory climbed to the highest opal spire, set with thousands of steps of veined marble. There were lagoons of blue water, and little birds fluttered about them and silver and gold fish darted through the still depths. They walked through the city, and he created a rose for her, white and yellow and red, and gardens of strange blooms. Between the two domed and spired buildings he created a vast pool of water. On it he put a purple canopied pleasure barge, loaded with every kind of food and drink he could remember. They floated across the lagoon, fanned by a soft breeze he had created. And all this is false, he reminded her after a little while. She smiled. No, it's not. You can touch it. It's real. Will it be here after I die? Who cares? Besides, if you can do all this, you can cure any sickness. 
Perhaps you can even cure old age and death. She plucked a blossom from an overhanging bough and sniffed its fragrance. You could keep this from fading and dying. You could probably do the same for us. So what's the problem? Would you like to go away, he said, puffing on a newly created cigarette? Would you like to find a new planet, untouched by war? Would you like to start over? Start over? You mean, later perhaps. Now I don't even want to go near the ship. It reminds me of the war. They floated on a little way. Are you sure now that I'm real? she asked. If you want me to be honest, no, he replied. But I want very much to believe it. Then listen to me, she said, leaning toward him. I'm real. She slipped her arm around his neck. I've always been real. I always will be real. You want proof? Well, I know I'm real. So do you. What more can you ask? He stared at her for a long time, felt her warm arms around his neck, listened to her breathing. He could smell the fragrance of her skin and hair, the unique essence of an individual. Shortly, he said, I believe you. I love you. What is your name? She thought for a moment. Joan. Strange, he said. I've always dreamed of a girl named Joan. What's your last name? She kissed him. Overhead, the swallows he had created, his swallows, wheeled in wide circles above the lagoon. His fish darted aimlessly to and fro, and his city stretched, proud and beautiful, to the edge of the twisted lava mountains. You didn't tell me your last name, he said. Oh, that! A girl's maiden name never matters. She always takes her husband's. That's an evasion. She smiled. It is, isn't it? End of Proof of the Pudding by Robert Checker The Rag and Bone Men by Algus Budris This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Dale Grothman Unfortunate castaway, marooned far from home, with nothing to share his loneliness but humans. The Rag and Bone Man by Algris Budris The other one, Carpentier, he called himself. He and I were going up the hill to the foundation, carrying our bags, when I happened to remark that I didn't think the veldt was sane any more. I call myself Maori. Carpentier said nothing for a moment. We kept walking up the gravel path between the unimaginatively clipped hedges. But he was frowning a little, and after a while he said in an absent way, Now, how would one determine that? He looked straight into my eyes, which is something that has always upset me, and challenged. I don't think one could. I felt the shock of inadequacy. Words came out of me, perfectly accurate words, I know but I never know how, and sometimes, when asked, I forget. Now I must be very lucid, I must be his kind of man, I thought, and pick my way among my words. These things he's got us get, I said, putting the burlap bag down and stopping so as to hold Carpentier in one place. He wants to build something unearthly, Carpentier said, annoyed because I was playing his kind of trick on him, and so baldly. What standard do you propose to judge by? But I was right and he was wrong. Now it remained to make him see how. Yes, he wants to build something unearthly, out of earthly parts. He wants to take six radio tubes from an earthly radio, three pieces of earthly lucite, exactly one quarter earthly inch thick, a roll of earthly sixteen gauge wire, a general electric heat lamp, and all these other things the polystyrene foam blocks, the polyurethane plastic sheeting, polyvinyl insulated tape. What have you in your bag, Carpentier? Out of all this, he wants to make a veldish thing. He spent years learning about earthly things, Carpentier pointed out. Four years we brought him books. Men. Everything he needs. 
Now he's learned what the earthly equivalents of Veldish materials are, and he's ready to make his new transporter. Carpentier had a dark face, dark hair, dark beard, dark eyes. When his dark brows drew together, it was easy to see that his best expression was dark scorn. I think he's desperate, I said. I think he's learned all he can. He's learned what the nearest earthly equivalents to Veldish things are. And he's learned that all Earth can give him nothing closer. I don't see how he can do better, even he. You cannot make apples of cabbages. But he wants to get home. You know he wants so much to leave here and get home. And now he's desperate, and is going to try to make a new transporter out of materials nothing like those in the one that broke and marooned him here. And it won't function? Carpentier asked. There is that risk. But why shouldn't he try? What's insane in that? I fear it might work. I fear it might work in ways a transporter should not. And I shivered, for if I say something, I feel it. And I do not feel anything I don't believe is right. I have been wrong, but not often. Or perhaps I forget. Carpentier smiled. How should a Veld transporter work? That's not the point, I cried at Carpentier's obstinacy at being Carpentier. I don't have to know. The Veld has to know. And to be insane enough to try something different. Look, I said, searching, being my own kind of man now, and letting the words come straight from the images in my head. Assume a man. Assume a man stranded on an island for years. Assume he has ways of realizing his heart's desire, if only he can find the things to work with. But it's a small island, and while it's a good island, how can it give a marooned man not only comfort, but heart's desire? He searches. Perhaps he sends messengers, if he himself cannot penetrate the jungle, such messengers as he can command. And in the end, after years, he knows he cannot have exactly what he wants. But he'd have something very near it. So in the end he takes a rag, a bone, and a hank of hair. And makes a woman, Carpentier laughed. If he fails, what of it? But if he succeeds, Carpentier, if he succeeds, couldn't he see? What sort of woman? Carpentier looked at me for a moment, but I hadn't made him see. He saw only me, and I had taken up his time without delivering value. So he chastened me. The Veld made me and you. Are you dissatisfied? He had that trick, Carpentier. If you tried to give him a problem he couldn't solve, he gave you a greater problem of your own, to add to the one you already carried. I picked up my bag and followed him up the hill to the foundation, where the Veld timelessly waited. It was dusk, and as I walked I turned my eyes up to the stars. One eye was larger than the other, and a different color. My nose sat askew on my lumpen face. Though Carpentier was a hunchback and lacked a finger, still he was a handsome hunchback. But I, whom the Veld had made second, with Carpentier's example, was merely whole. And from my eyes, tears. We entered the foundation. It had been erected around the Veld when he first came, and there were men who could question. Now the building was neat and kept up, but all its many rooms were empty and all its many machines were still. Carpentier had his cottage on the west. A very learned man had used it while working with the Veld. And I had mine on the east, where the military commander had kept his family. The Veld lived in the heart of the foundation, in an odd-shaped room whose walls traced the configuration he had been forced to assume when his broken transporter had interrupted his journey between where and the home he pined for. Men came from the town below the hill to care for the building, but Carpentier or I had to go fetch them. They no longer questioned. They distressed us with their constant need for commanding, and so every time they were finished with their work, we commanded them homeward. No earthly creature lived on the hill. The Veld was kind, but an end comes to kindness. The time came when the questioning of men would have led them, if answered, irrevocably into Veldish ways. 
It was perhaps a kindness, too, that the Veld did what he did to questioning creatures. But however it may have been, now there were only men to be commanded. Carpentier commanded in the west, and I in the east, and the Veld, though he permitted us to question all men, and each other, commanded us. Carpentier and I did not often speak to each other while on the foundation. We were too near the Veld, and insufficiently full of ourselves. But as we rode down in the elevator with its noise of metal sliding all alone in the world, Carpentier looked at me. And I knew what he looked. I have thought to myself that Carpentier says of everything, Why is this thing not perfect? While I say to myself, Where is the perfection in this thing? Surely my thought is as potent as his. But you see his advantage over me, for he is forever safe from what I might look at him. But I, I was not safe. We reached the chamber of the Veld. We opened the door and displayed our accumulation to his perceptions. My being reflects you, the Veld told us from his perception, and seeing that he was become beautiful, I knew we had done well. Now will I make and take my way, and you, in your sorrow, stay to see the world restored. This was what he had promised the world and us before he put an end to questioning, though only we remembered. But I wondered, I did not question, I wondered, as I imagined his making of the new transporter, taking my imagined thing from what I knew of how he made us. I wondered whether the world was safe. I thought of the chamber beside this one, where we had been born. I had often been there, only to look. There is a tank, the Rochester, Minnesota Biophysical Equipment Company tank. And there is a Velikaya Socialiskeschaya Rosinia coagulator. And the IBM 704. And the Braun Bolivari heater. There stand the cabinets, with their torsion held metal refrigerator units, and the cabinets full of flasks and ampules, and there is an autoclave full of Becton, Dixon, Yale syringes, and dangling from the wall are the Waldos that the Veld used to manipulate all of these things. And of all of these earthly things the Veld made men not entirely earthly, but the Veld is a Veld. Now soon the new transporter would take the Veld away in ways I wondered were perilous, and it would be Carpentier and I who stayed to see the world restored. Carpentier and I, who called ourselves, but had no names. He commanded us to go, and we went. I east, Carpentier west. I saw Carpentier hurry down his side of the hill, handsome and hasty under the stars. I walked. For me, to run is a risk and I trembled. For me to feel is to know, and the Veld was desperate. He slept at night, secure from questions, even though he slept, for his power, once exercised, was irrevocable so long as he existed. But tonight he did not sleep. He made. I thought of my assumed man, on his assumed island, red-eyed and tremulous of hand, bent over his pot, stirring, stirring, unable to wait for morning. I thought of the light from his fire, shining in the dumb eyes of his faithful messengers, waiting on the edge of his clearing. The messengers are dismissed from service, yet not quite sure they are dismissed. And I thought of this earth, and the Veld's old promise to us that tomorrow it would wake, knuckling its eyes, and need a loving voice to say there was an end to nightmares. I would speak. Carpentier would speak. But what would we say? And in what voices, born of the Veld's touch, on the Waldos? And would there be more than speaking to do? I did not think there was much I could do but speak. Carpentier lacks a finger, but I, I have hands, but I lack them. Oh, but the stars were cold. The moon in this season is a day moon, and now below the horizon. Stars, stars and galaxies, but beyond them, where the Veldish beings live, nothing I could see. And below the stars, too, 
Here, where I reached the brow of the hill, and clumsily opened my wings. Here, too, nothing, as I lurched into the night, and in great strain beat toward the places of men. I had a favorite place, a place I had chosen to begin to speak from. It was small, as men measure things. A few lights in the darkness. Here the sheen of the lake. There the tiered woolliness of trees. A town in which I disposed those men who must first unbind themselves from years of no questioning. For unlike the Veld and his transporter, and even the Veld needed a transporter, Carpentier and I could not be everywhere. It was my thought to reassure these men first, and have them go out and reassure others, as older brothers will soothe the younger in the night. I knew from an old argument that Carpentier planned the same. But, of course, they would not be the same sort of men for Carpentier as for me. Still, they were all men. Once they had all rubbed the sleep from their eyes, they would tell each other what they saw, and in the end, and all men would have to agree on the shape of the world so it would not matter what imperfections Carpentier pointed out, or what implicit glories I perceived, if the Veld's hands did not tremble as he stirred his pot. And yet it had, it had. Carpentier had said more than he thought when he had thought to stop my mouth with myself. I faced away from the foundation, now mile on mile behind me. But my eyes turned inward, and in me my mind hovered over the Veld, I had no actual distant eye, no way of seeing beyond the curve of the world, or through the haze of the air, no ear to hear a sound so far away that it cannot urge the molecules of air my pinions grope at. But often it was well enough to think, for any thought seems accurate enough to act on, and in time thoughts grow so practiced that they might as well be eyes. And so I saw the veil, though I did not see him, and I saw him falter. In me the Veld suddenly told, I have made, and I go. Forgive me for your sorrow. And I forgave him, as I had forgiven him long ago, for his duty was to men, not to ourselves, who are part of the duty. And Carpentier, I knew, had nothing to forgive, for he was glad of his sorrow. Wind numbed my eyes. I wept. Under the cold stars my crude cheeks glistened. I hovered over the town, where some men slept, and some men worked, because some machines ran during the day, and some ran at night. And I listened for anything else the Veld might have to tell, for he was my irrevocable commander as long as he existed on this earth. I also listened with the ear of habitated thought. And I heard. In my mind's eye I saw the Veld, use the earthly transporter. But it was not with my mind's ear alone that I heard what I heard. The pot erupts. The stranded man claws back in agony so great he cannot even scream, arms, legs, and face smoldering, and jounces on the ground to lie, to moan, to be a long, mindless time dying. And at the clearing's edge the little messengers have no one to say what could be done to soothe him. What now? Where to go? What to do? How to repair? Oh, Veld, Veld, long-living Veld, what truly eternal sorrow! I sank down through the air, bereft and graceless. What could I do for the Veld? All that remained for me was what I could say to men, but I knew as I landed among them that the Veld's promise could not be kept, since the Veld was still here. I cried out to the men, Awake! Arise! They stumbled out of their houses, but when I said to the first of them, Question me! He obediently answered, How? I go back to where the foundation was now and then. I bring doctors with me. After each time it seems to me that I have found a way to tell them what to seek. The Veld lies where his chamber was, before the stone decayed, and tells me nothing. If he truly reflects me, as he is now, then I don't know if I can bear to wait for the day when I can dash myself down from the outraged air and surrender myself to the sea-speckled rocks. 
The doctors say that if only someone would tell them what questions to ask about the Veld, and if only someone would give them the answers to the questions, they might be able to do something. Carpentier is there sometimes and mocks me. You're getting crazier every day, Maurer, he says. Suppose you restore the Veld. Then what? Does he make another transporter? He shakes his head. Poor Maurer. What are you going to do to these people you bring here? What do you want from them? Something the Veld himself couldn't accomplish? I try. I try to tell them how to question, and I command them to question, and I hope the Veld dies. But though Carpentier and I, even Carpentier and I, are growing a little older, the Veld is still more bun and no more dead than he was before the days when thirty generations of men battled to keep the southmost edge of the creeping ice from burying the veld beyond the reach of hope. For I hope, though I can see a sprig of silver here and there, in Carpentier's darkness now. The veld must be accessible to my hope, though I must command millions of men. And I think Carpentier hopes, too, because so long as he can see me failing, he knows I am imperfect, but he wishes perfection for me. I know he brings no doctors only because he has not yet found a way for men to respond to the command, Be perfect. Every time the hope dies, I tell my men, Go home now, rest. And they go home. But I, I blunder about thinking that perhaps if I could kill the Veld, that would be the end of it. But nothing can kill the Veld, unless it be something the Veld knows of. So first we must heal the Veld. And healed he will once again seek his heart's desire, hopelessly. As do I. As do I. End of the Rag and Bone Men by Algris Budris The Semantic War by Bill Clothier. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Reading by Matt Perard. The Semantic War by Bill Clothier. Perhaps there have been causes for slaughter just as silly as this was, but try to find one. The rain pours down, chill, out of a sullen sky. My pace quickens as I try to regain the relative warmth and shelter of the cavern before I become thoroughly drenched. I cannot afford to catch a cold. All alone as I am, and with no medicine, I would stand too great a chance of a quick death. These lowering Oregon skies still hold traces of nameless disease in their writhing cloud tendrils. I am not just afraid of a cold that would only be the key for some other malady to use and strike me down forever. I see the cave up ahead and feel a sense of contentment as I draw near and then duck inside its stony mouth. The rain hisses without, but inside it is dry. There is a heavy cowhide hanging on a peg in the wall, and I take it down and wrap it around me soon i will be warm once more i may stave off my ultimate end sometimes i wonder why i wish to put it off certainly according to my old standards there is no point in living but somehow i feel that the mere fact of living is justification in itself even for such a life as mine i didn't always feel this way but then my circumstances change and people change with them i changed my circumstances more than myself but i had no alternative so now i exist i suppose i should be content after all i am alive and in my own simple way i enjoy life i can remember people who ask nothing more than to be allowed to live to exist ironically enough i always considered them subnormal I felt that a man should strive to do something that would not only perpetuate the happiness of his own life, but that of his fellow men. 
something that would make life more beautiful and easier and more kind it was with this feeling that i applied myself as a student of philosophy at stanford university and the strengthening of this same belief led me to take up teaching and embrace it as the only way of obtaining genuine happiness my personal philosophy was simple i would learn about life in all its real and symbolic meanings and then teach it to my pupils each of whom i felt sure were thirsting for the knowledge that i was extracting from my cultural environment i would show them the meaning behind things that i felt was the key to successful living now it seems strangely pathetic that i should have essayed such an impossible task but even a professor of philosophy can be mistaken and become confused i remember when i first became aware of the movement for years we had been drilling certain precepts into the soft impressionable heads of those students who came under our influence liberalism some called it the right to take the values accumulated by society over a period of hundreds of years and bend them to fit whatever idea or act was contemplated by such methods it was possible to fit the mores to the deed and not the deed to the mores oh it was a wonderful theory one that promised to project all human activities entirely beyond good and evil however i digress it was a spring morning at berkeley california when i had my first inkling of the movement i was sitting in my office gazing out the window and considering life in my usual contemplative fashion i might say i was being rather smug i was thinking how fortunate i was to have been graduated from stanford with such high honors and how my good luck had stayed with me until i received my doctor's degree in a famous eastern university and came out to take an associate professorship at the berkeley campus i was watching the hurrying figures below on the crosswalks and idly noting the brilliant green of the shrubbery and the trees and the lawn i was mixing up keats with a bit of philosophy and thoroughly enjoying myself knowledge is truth truth beauty i mused that is all we know on earth and all we need to know there was a knock on my door and i said come in reluctantly abandoning my train of thought which had just picked up shakespeare whom i was going to consider as two-thirds philosopher and one-third poet i have never felt that the field of literature had the sole claim to shakespeare's greatness professor lilith came in visibly perturbed lilith was a somewhat erratic individual for a professor at least and he was often perturbed once he became excited about the possibilities of the campus shrubbery being stunted and discolored by the actions of certain dogs living on campus he was not a philosophy professor of course but a member of the political science group carlson he asked nervously have you heard about it yet i have no idea i returned good-naturedly heard about what he looked behind him as if he thought he might be followed then he whirled around his sharp-featured face alight with feeling carlson the wistic dufels the Moratti and he stared at me intently his gimlet eyes almost blazing i stared back at him blankly you haven't heard he exclaimed i thought surely you would know about it you're always talking about freedom to apply thought for the good of humanity well we're finally going to do something about it you'll see keep your ears open carlson and then he turned and started out of the room he paused at the threshold and fixed me again with his ferret-like eyes the wistic de fells the morati he said and vanished through the door and that was my first unheeded omen of what was to come i paid little attention to it lilith wasn't the sort of man who inspired attention as a matter of fact i considered reporting him to the head of his department as being on the verge of a nervous breakdown but i didn't 
in those days nervous breakdowns were a common occurrence around college campuses the educational profession was a very hazardous occupation one southern university for example reported five faculty suicides during spring quarter in the days that followed however i began to realize that there was some sort of movement being fostered by the student body it couldn't be defined but it could be felt and seen the students began to form groups and hold meetings often without official sanction what they were about could not be discovered but some of the results soon became evident for one thing certain students began to walk on one side of the street and the other students walked on the other side the ones who used the north side of the street wore green sweaters with white trousers or skirts and the south side students wore white sweaters with green trousers or skirts it even got to the point where those in green sweaters went only to classes in the morning and those in white attended the afternoon sessions then the little white cards began to appear they were sent through the mail they were slipped under doorways and in desk drawers they turned up beside your plate at dinner and under your pillow at night they were pasted on your front door in the morning and they appeared in the fly-leaves of your books they were even hung on trees like fruit and surely no fruit ever spored so queer a seedling they said either one thing or the other the wistic dufels the moratti or the moratti dufels the wistic which card belonged to what group was not immediately clear it was not until the riots broke out that the thing began to be seen in its proper perspective and then it was too late when the first riot started it was assumed that the university officials and the police could quell it in a very short time but strangely enough as additional police were called in the battle raged even more fiercely i could see part of the affair from my window and therefore was able to understand why the increasing police force only added to the turmoil they were fighting one another and through the din could be heard the wild shouts of the wistic dufels the moratti or the moratti dufels the wistic the final blow came when i saw the registrar and the dean of men struggling fiercely in one of the hedgerows and heard the dean of men yell in wild exultation as he brought a briefcase down on the registrar's head the wisting dufels the moratti then someone broke in through the door of my office i turned in alarm and saw a huge three-letter man standing only a few feet from me he had been in one of my classes i remembered something about his being the hardest driving fullback on the pacific coast he was certainly the dumbest philosophy student i ever flunked his hair was mussed and he was wild-eyed he had blood on his face and chest and his clothes were torn and grass-stained the wistic dufels the moretti he said get out of my office i told him coldly and stay out so you're on the other side he snarled i hoped you would be he started toward me and i seized a bookend on my desk and tried to strike him with it but he brushed it aside and came on in his first blow nearly broke my arm and as i dropped my guard due to the numbing pain he struck me solidly on the side of the jaw when i recovered consciousness i was lying by the side of my desk where i had fallen my head ached and my neck was stiff i got painfully to my feet and then noticed the big square of cardboard pinned to the door of my office it was lettered in red pencil and in past tense said the wistic do felt the moratti the uprisings arose spontaneously in all parts of the country they were not confined to colleges they were not confined to any particular group they encompassed nearly the entire population and the fervor aroused by their battle cry whichever one it might be was beyond all comprehension i could not understand either slogan's meaning and there were others like myself on several occasions i attempted to find out but i was beaten twice and threatened with a pistol the third time so i gave up all such efforts 
i was never much given to any sort of physical violence one night i went home thoroughly disheartened by the state of affairs the university was hardly functioning nearly the entire faculty including the college president had been drawn into one camp or the other their actions were utterly abhorrent to me if the professor was a green top or a rustician he lectured only to green tops if he belonged to the moradians or white top faction they were the only ones who could enter his classroom the two groups were so evenly divided that open violence was frowned upon as a means of attaining whatever end they had in view they were biding their time and gathering strength for fresh onslaughts on each other as i say i went home feeling very discouraged my wife was in the kitchen preparing dinner and i went in and sat down at the table while she worked the daily paper was lying on the table its headlines loaded with stories of bloodshed and strife throughout the nation i glanced through them lately there seemed to be a sort of pattern forming east of the mississippi the general slogan was emerging as the moradi to felling the wistic west of the mississippi the wistic was receiving the greater support and it seemed that the younger people and the women preferred the moradi while elderly people and most men were on the side of the wistic i commented on this my wife answered briefly of course anyone should know that the moradi will win out she went on with the preparations for dinner not looking at me i sat stunned for a moment great god in heaven not my wife am i to understand that you are taking any part of this seriously i asked with some heat the whole thing is a horrible pointless prank she turned and faced me squarely not to me i say the moradi will win out i want it to and i think you'd be wise to get on the bandwagon while there's still time i realized she was serious dead serious i tried a cautious query just what does the dufellation of the wistic by the moradi mean and it made her angry it actually made her angry she swished off the front burner and walked past me into the living room i didn't think she was going to answer but she did sort of there is no excuse for an egghead in your position not knowing what it means her voice was strained and tense if you had any perception whatever you would understand what the moradi has to give the american people it's our only hope and you've got to take sides you're either for the moradi or the wistic you can't take the middle way i felt completely isolated wait i don't know what it means forget it she broke in i should have known you were born you have lived and you will die an egghead in an ivory tower just remember the moradi dufels the wistic and she swept on upstairs to pack and out of my life and that's the way it was whatever malignant poison had seeped into the collective brain of the nation it was certainly a devastating leveller of all sorts of institutions and values wives left husbands and husbands left wives joint bank accounts vanished families disintegrated wall street crumbled developments were swift and ominous the army split up into various groups most of the enlisted men favored the moradi but the officers and older non-coms pledged the wistician faith their power was sufficient to hold many in line but a considerable number in the lower ranks deserted and joined forces with the moradians who held the eastern half of the country the wistics ruled the western half with an iron hand and all signs pointed toward civil war labor and military authorities conscripted the entire population regardless of age sex or religious convictions for my own part i slipped away from the campus and fled north into the oregon mountains it was not that i was afraid to fight but i rebelled at the absolute stupidity of the whole thing the idea fighting because of a few words but they did the destruction was frightful however it was not as bad as many had thought it would be 
the forces of the wistic leveled the city of new york true but it took three h-bombs to do the job instead of one as the air force had claimed in retaliation san francisco and los angeles were destroyed in a single night by cleverly placed atom bombs smuggled in by a number of fifth columnist wives who gained access to the cities under the pretext of returning to their husbands this was a great victory for the moravians even though the women had to blow themselves up to accomplish their mission the moravian forces were slowly beaten back toward the atlantic shores they were very cunning fighters and they had youthful courage to implement that cunning but their overall policy lacked the stability and long-range thinking necessary to the prosecution of total war one day they might overrun many populous areas and the next day due to the constant bickering and quarrelling among their own armies they would lose all they had won and more too finally in desperation they loosed their most horrible weapon germ warfare but they forgot to protect themselves against their own malignity the semantic war ground to a shuddering halt the carrion smell of death lay round the world the dupellation of the wistic and the marathi so here i am scuttling around in the forest like a lonely pack rat it is not the sort of life i would choose if there were any other choice yet life has become very simple i enjoy the simple things and i enjoy them with gusto when i find food that suits my stomach i am happy when i quench my thirst i am happy when i see a beautiful sunset from one of my mountain crags i am happy it takes little when you have little and there have been few men who have had less only one thing troubles me i suppose it doesn't matter but i go on wondering i wonder which side was right i mean really right end of the semantic war by bill clothier